And she never wanted to leave 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 What was today's episode called? It was called A Night of the Seven Kingdoms. A Night of the Seven Kingdoms, eh? Was yes, that... indeed. Oh, it's about like K N. I see. Oh my god. <laughs> let's uh, let's just stop. We're, we're, we've hit rock bottom already. <laughs> oh. Christ. All right. All right. Anyway. Okay. I oh. I love that episode. I really enjoyed that. Really. I have. To, yeah. I really oh, really enjoyed good. it. Yeah. What about you? Um. Nah. Really? Yeah. No, I didn't. No. Oh wow. Yeah. Why? Uh, quite a lot of reasons. Um, huh. it was it was better, I thought. Um, yeah. No, look. Okay. Uh, t- for me, this this episode really felt like fan fiction. Really? Yeah. Massive. Okay, so. that's really interesting because I thought it was far less pandering than last week's. Right. Okay. The Arya and Gendry stuff. Felt like fan okay. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm on board with that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Brienne being knighted bit feels like fan fiction to me. Wow. Okay. The various conversations and group huddles f- uh, felt like fan fiction to me in the sense that everyone was gathered around in these little Avengers esque uh, <laughs> formations. The discussions about tactics now this isn't fan fiction but the discussion about tactics were not 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 genuine battle conversations like in the earlier seasons in other words in the previous seasons it felt like when they had those conversations it felt like you can imagine these things happening out off the camera whereas now it's like they thought let's have that character bring up something about the tactics what can he say about the tactics and they say something that could be completely generic about any form of strategy in a in a war. Let's get into this because well, I think we should go through it in order again, like we did last week, maybe. But sure. I just want to say, first off, I am I do look forward to hearing what why you thought uh, Brienne being knighted was fan fiction because okay. I com- I completely disagree with that. Okay, but yeah. great. Anyway, great. we'll, we'll move up to, to that because that's that's at the very end. Yeah. yeah cool. Sweet. All right. So obviously it started, and actually, yeah, you 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 remind us how it started. Uh, well, it just uh, it's kind of a cold. Well, it's not um, literally a cold open, but it, it's pretty much a cold open uh, with Jamie and Winterfell being tried. Is it a trial? It's not really. He's just kind of being heard and criticised. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I had guessed that Bran would stand up for him. Mm. There, that didn't happen, but uh, it kind of happened in a different way later on in the episode um they kind of reconciled a bit but i i did like i did like that opening scene with jamie and i like the fact that he wouldn't apologize for what he'd done uh when he was at war with the starks that actually felt realistic and true to his character like too often um in this show recently we've seen characters pandering to other characters where it wouldn't really make sense and it would have been very easy to make him be really apologetic about everything. But mm-hmm. I like the fact that he had a bit of backbone there sure. and stood up for his family after everything. I was actually slightly disappointed. I thought it was... I, I liked the scene. I liked how it played out. And I think Nikolai... Is it Nikolai? Yeah, Nikolai. I thought he um, he, he just brings up the quality in the scenes that he's in. I think he's great. Yeah, I think he's one of the best performers. Yeah, same. He, he has this real truth to him, like in yeah. the way he performs. Uh, I, I sometimes feel like I'm watching the other actors rather than their characters now. Um, Maisie Williams. With Maisie and Daenerys. Even <laughs> Daenerys for, to an extent, and even Tyrion to an extent now. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then when when there's a scene with Nikolai in it, I, I always feel like I'm watching Jamie Lannister, not Nikolai. Yeah, I agree. 
Um, and yeah, I thought that that scene played out really well, and I thought the performances were good. And I, but I, I was actually disappointed that your prediction didn't play out as you said. Mm. And the reason I, for, for those who weren't listening, who haven't seen our last episode, what was your prediction, Kian? Um, essentially that the scene would kind of play out as it did, but then Bran would actually speak up and tell everyone present publicly about the real reason Jamie killed the Mad King and that basically uh, people's perception of him has been false all this time and maybe bring up other honourable things he's done, which Brienne did, which actually makes sense as well. Um, but yeah, essentially that Bran would publicly stand up for him and then that would kind of be a nice uh not an end to Jamie's arc maybe but a nice another moment another notable moment in it mm. yeah uh, the reason why I'm disappointed that didn't happen really is because I don't fully buy the the actual uh reasoning that got Jamie off the hook there considering the things that Jamie has done I think Brienne standing up for Jamie in that in those circumstances first of all i'm not sure brienne had the um uh prestige or the uh power to stand up and walk to the front like that um in the first place in more realistic terms and second of all well at this uh, yeah i mean well ruling in the north right they've always given whoever's present their time to speak like if anyone shouts up they hear them out it's the same in the books as well They're yeah very kind of it's very team-based leading yeah but do you not feel that the way that that played out was quite dramatic overly like like the way she walks to the front of the throne room and like i don't know and yeah the, maybe yeah uh maybe maybe i'm wrong actually that that to be fair I, i'm happy to concede that actually uh you're probably right. Um, maybe I'm being overcritical. So, but then I still, I'm still not convinced that that was a good enough. I mean, he's done a lot of shit as far as they're concerned, like yeah. a lot. Um, I just felt that it it wouldn't have been quite enough, and I felt that it was a really good opportunity there for for Bran to use because we haven't actually seen Bran speaking up in front of everyone like these guys. <laughs> everyone there we haven't certainly yeah. certainly in front of Daenerys and showing the level of knowledge he has it would have been a great opportunity to show what Bran is to yeah. everyone and it would have just been a really legitimate reason to forgive him um, and to have a deeper understanding of his motives and I just yeah. felt that they missed that opportunity a little bit um, yeah no I, I I totally agree with you it's just I yeah I think that would have been a much better way to do the scene as well but as the scene is I don't really have that many have an issue with it mm-hmm. to be honest but yeah that 100% that would have been a better way to do it mm. I still think it played out pretty well yeah oh Arya and Gendry in, in the forge yeah where Maisie Williams is just being really aloof and arrogant and cocky and just unbearable yeah I, I'm I <sighs> What's going on with I that? She's. I I can't stand her. I can't stand Arya anymore. No, is I can't work out what's going on with that. Is that a, is that a writing decision and an act an acting I don't decision? Ha- I, I, don't I don't think it's writing. I to don't be either. I mean, you can. Either... I think it's her performance. Yeah, and she's pouting constantly. Like yeah, like physically, literally pouting. Yeah. In almost every <laughs> shot, I don't yeah. know. I don't know what what she's doing really. She um because which I don't understand because I think she's a good actor. Right. Yeah, she is. Um, yeah, the all of these scenes between Gendry and I come across really fan fictiony to me. Yeah, they're very contrived. Yeah, and the dialogue's really bad in them. Yeah, for some reason. I mean, really what was is. it they said about very bad or something? What was it? Very badly. Really bad. She's asking what the dead are like, and he's like, bad, really bad. Yeah, and, and then she's she, like, she really makes, bad. Yeah, she even, like takes the even, piss out of it. Like, yeah, even a blacksmith's apprentice can do better than that, or something like that. Yeah, and it's like, it's well, like, what? Well, yeah, it's that's a bad line, actually. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but you, you just pointed out that it's a bad line. Like, um, I don't yeah. really know why well, that played out like that. But, um, yeah. Yeah, so that whole... The, the dynamic between those two feels really, really forced to me. Um, I'm not convinced we've got any grounding for the level of love these two have for each other. Um, love might be too strong a word, or maybe lust. I'm not sure there's been any previous... Or, or enough previous to that personally. no there there hasn't uh yeah they weren't they weren't even together for long it was only seasons two and a bit of three yeah to be honest and that's partly why it feels like fan fiction because people people wanted that they shipped that didn't they yeah and, uh so after that is like uh bran and jamie in the gods would we've kind of covered that already yeah it's like no problems there. <laughs> you reminded me of someone there. Oh no! I don't know. Who? I don't know. I can't. I can't figure it out. That was really weird. Then we've got. Uh, oh yeah, the, the next section is basically Jamie walking around Winterfell, talking to people. So it's Bran and then Tyrion and then Brienne. Yeah. So yeah, I I don't know. I liked all that stuff. I I do. I don't know what it is about Dinklage as Tyrion. He's still boring to me at the moment, but. I think I've narrowed it down. I think it's the beard. His face isn't as expressive when you can't see it with that massive beard on his face. Like, generally, that sounds like a really stupid point to make, but I think it's true. <laughs> that, like, he, he has such an expressive face, and you can see that in the first uh, three or four seasons. Whereas, since he's got the beard, you can't make out his expressions as much. This sounds like such a childish thing to say, but I, I kind of... I was thinking about it earlier, trying to figure out why I found Tyrion so boring. You could and, be right. Uh, I think think that's that could be part of it. It could be part of it. I think personally, it's just that he is being given less to do. Although I do feel that uh, when I say given less to do, I don't mean in terms of literal uh, lines. I mean in terms of character action. Yeah. Um, yeah. But having said that, I do feel that we are. I did get a sense of the old Tyrion a bit more here, which I enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily in this yeah. scene, but in this episode. Yeah. Um, Later on as well, yeah. And it was a nice call back to the uh, being in bed with the girl's mouth around his cock. Yeah. Then no, yeah, only for that. But okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Then he talks to Brienne. <clears throat> yeah. So. Outside. Oh yeah, that's the tactics bit. So. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually liked it as they were walking out and I could see the more training for stuff. Yep. And, like, Grey Worm was sort of almost almost a featured extra there, which I thought was cool because he, yep. was, he, was he was, like, figuring stuff out. Um, I thought that's really cool. We're, we're getting a bit of a sense of this battle is a, it could be happening soon and that's really cool. Yeah, there's, there's but then, a sense of scale. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. But then all this stuff about if we can keep a tight formation and all that sort of stuff I just thought oh god man you could be saying that about absolutely anything it feels... yeah they, ha- they haven't thought it through specific to the no, situation exactly I mean it, this is the this is the uh, not um, the problem with, with, with not having the source material because it's really difficult admittedly to write dialogue in such a manner that doesn't come across contrived if you haven't got the actual stuff that's happening like you haven't got the what the reason why it didn't come come across as contrived in the past was because it it wasn't <laughs> and because yeah. there was the stuff ended up happening in some form or, form or another so they could just draw from this huge pool of information that George had written in the script um, in the books or you know even uh, what uh, the um Song of Ice and Fire uh, people on their website, they ended up compiling specifics that they'd been able to figure out from little pieces of information that were scattered throughout the books that weren't explicitly noted. And all of that stuff was used in the earlier seasons. So if they ever came up against a problem or they wanted to know what happened with a battle or a particular sequence, they literally just drew upon that and yeah. it always felt really organic because of that. 
mm-hmm. and now they, they we haven't got any of that so it's just completely shallow and you can sense its shallowness as well it just comes across as shallow even if yeah it's it's just set up and pay off over a very short space of time yeah really. totally yeah but um yeah i still still enjoyed it it was certainly built the the uh the battle up um and i'm nervous for the battle yeah and this all contributed to that yeah which is good mm. <clears throat> so what did you think about sansa and daenerys Clearly actually i thought scene. that was a good scene yeah i like that yeah i thought it was a really good scene um it came across as really uh, organic didn't it and natural and yeah, made sense it made sense yeah totally and the little the little twist at the end was surprising um when i say the twist you know when when sansa basically said well what do we do after the war's won yeah yeah and, it's she's almost testing danny like to be honest danny's sincerity about the whole thing mm. and yeah yeah but the great thing about that sort of writing is is as you say it could be that she's testing it but it could also be uh, at face value and then she asks this deeper question and it's just uh, stuff like that is it's really important and um i mean it does actually bring up one of the problems i have with it which is that they they are they're really milking this who's going to end up on the Iron Throne thing. Um, yeah. That is, the, that is the crux of the story now. Which, yeah, which doesn't seem right. No, if it, that feels wrong to me. Again, that feels like fan fiction to me because it feels yeah. like they're just playing into expectations as opposed to being truthful to its roots. Yeah. Um, but what I would say, at the same time, the, the main kind of harbinger for that uh, angle about who ends up on the Iron Throne is Danny. She's the one who's always talking about it. It always comes back to her being That's... on the throne and I think it it had this episode in particular showed that aspect of her in quite a negative light. Yeah. Yeah, great she's point. She's very very single-minded and she specifically in the scene we're talking about she called it John's War. Yeah. I noticed that. It's it's not John's War and like I Sansa noticed that as well I'm sure Mm -hmm. now this is me giving Brian Cogman credit and I hope it's due because I did think that was very clever and very intelligent and subtle Mm -hmm. so I hope that actually pays off that uh, the meaning we're supposed to draw from that scene is seeing that Danny, despite giving up everything and coming up north for John for this she still doesn't see the bigger picture as surviving the bigger picture for her is her ending up on the throne and that's it yeah the characters in this uh episode in particular felt more like with the exception of probably Arya and Gendry uh yeah. the characters felt like they were those characters in terms of the writing mm-hmm. um yeah and as you said that's a really good point again about Daenerys she's the one that keeps bringing it back to that essentially yeah so and that does make sense because it does yeah yeah that's been her identity for yes her whole life for her whole life exactly and she said that actually so mm-hmm. so it, it it yeah that's actually a really good point it it lessened that the feeling that the whole show is just about being on the iron throne and it <laughs> it, it, it made that it brought that into a, a light that made sense again mm. um yeah so i i definitely enjoyed that scene it was well acted as well it was and right after that Theon comes back and I love that I I don't know I got really emotional <laughs> yeah I got quite emotional I, actually yeah yeah I thought I, that was really earned yeah I mean I mean um, Alfie Allen's just a brilliant actor as well I he think is. like facially yeah like, he his eyes are just like brilliant during yeah. that scene because he's seeking forgiveness and and that's the end of Theon's redemption arc right there. That's it, yeah. It's complete. And Sansa's given him that forgiveness, essentially. Yeah. And that says a lot about Sansa too, which yeah. is what which is why it's a good scene, because it does it does two things. And there's another layer as well, because uh Daenerys is there too, and the first thing 
Theon does when he comes in is he he shows the proper courtesies to Daenerys, calls her your grace or my queen, whatever he says. He kneels. He says Yara has gone back to the Iron Islands to take them back in her name. Mm-hmm. Like he's he's very respectful, right? Um, but then those barriers don't exist between him and Sansa. They're family. I think that what that scene is also trying to get at is that Daenerys doesn't really understand true love in the familial sense. Mm-hmm. Um, her her reign and her ruling is all about respect and loyalty. Whereas I don't think she understands ruling through love. And because she, she has kind of a weird reaction when like Sansa runs over and hugs Theon. Mm. I think she's kind of seen for the first time that she actually doesn't understand the North and that they really do have this kind of tight historical bond. Oh, well, I, I really hope you're right about all that. <laughs> I do because I didn't quite sense all of that. And maybe it's because I've become slightly cynical. Um, yeah. But if that is true, then that's that's great and hopefully we get we get more of a sense of these subtleties over the over the next the next four episodes yeah that's the problem only four episodes yeah. left yeah but um yeah because it feels yeah because that's a really good point and i hope that's i hope that's accurate you know so do i i only picked it up on my second viewing by the way like i didn't catch that first time around okay cool so yeah then we have <coughs> Davos oh, right. at the so, soup kitchen. So yeah, one of the things that I found weird here was that Davos was literally serving <laughs> soup. Um yeah. which I just found weird. You know, that he's there doing that. It was one of the things that just felt like they're they're um They're forcing a scene. Yeah. That and and they're slotting characters in to doing jobs that they shouldn't be doing exactly it's it's what you uh said very early on when we were uh predicting this season and talking about it before it started that uh they don't want to kill their darlings anymore this was one of their darlings they wanted this scene to happen so they slotted him into a place where it didn't actually make sense for him to be yeah exactly um yeah it was actually it was actually kind of it's actually almost like if they had davos a few scenes later doing something else it, it it was one step away from being parody because Davos <laughs> if, if they could have quite easily had Davos in another scene like in the uh, Ironmongers um, like <laughs> you know making weapons and then it would be like you know and it was only one step away from that I mean it, it, I get what it's doing it's saying all hands to the deck I think that's what they're trying to pretend that they're saying yeah and maybe acknowledging Davos coming from Flea Bottom and coming from like the lowest end, lowest yeah. like class. Yeah, grouping. Then but, that's all. Yeah. That's all fine. But but it's still it's still if you actually think it through, it doesn't. Re- it still doesn't make sense. It, it, no. The reason it doesn't make sense is because there'll be other people doing those jobs. He is needed other places now. Yes, and exactly. also from a literally from a practical perspective, how has that functioned? How has that worked out? Has he just gone up and <laughs> like started doing it like or is he wrote it into that because you know they would have people doing certain jobs and specific jobs at certain times that's how it would work <laughs> so what what's happened there how has it worked from a practical perspective and that question is unanswerable and the fact that it's unanswerable is it says volumes next up is ed and Tormund and Beric arriving back at Winterfell. Oh, this is like a really brief little thing. I love Tormund. <laughs> yeah, I really like Tormund in this episode. Now, I, 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 I found well. him quite annoying at some points in the past, but right. I thought he was great in this. Yeah. I really liked him in yeah, this I episode. Yeah, I liked him too. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, like that, okay. Some scenes uh, that are... Some comic relief scenes in this show are awful. Like ones in recent memory. Mm. But when... John's walking over um, to Ed and Tormund just tackles him from off screen. Yeah. I, that That's good. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. And it's, again, it's like it's organic and it's, you know, it's what it Tormund sense. would do. Yeah. He's, he's Asperger's as fuck. Like, <laughs> <laughs> as Jim Jeffries would say. Oh, um, God. Yeah. Like, he, he's from, he's a wildling. He's, yeah. you know, 
that's yeah. the sort of and thing that- he would do. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I really liked it when they were discussing uh, tactics around the table on the from a sort of a visual and uh, law perspective, um, yeah. but not from the perspective that it felt like the Avengers assemble. <laughs> Yeah, where it's just literally all characters that we know there, and that's it. Yeah, no, literally, no one else. Literally is there. all of them. Yeah, is Pod in there as well? I'm I'm flicking through it now. I'm gonna have a look. <laughs> he probably is. He probably is, isn't he? Like, there's literally there's there's, there's uh, late um, what's her face, Lyanna. Lyanna Stark. Yeah. Uh, no. No. Jeez. What? No. Lyanna Mormont. What am I yeah, Lyanna Mormont. Um is there Brienne Jamie who's literally only just turned up and no one trusts or only like half trusts yeah. uh, definitely Tormund who, and now he's like a wild thing I guess he might be in there for battle reasons um, oh, Varys is there for some reason who is oh yeah yeah. why is she there <laughs> is, Varys is a, Varys is an extra now is he in there yeah Varys is just standing there <laughs> Beric <laughs> Beric Dondarrion's there Theon's there. He'd be, why would he be there? Um, I he's literally a subsord, um, subord, uh, subordinate. Yes. Yeah. Complete subordinate. <coughs> who's the Who's the woman next to Theon? Alice Carstark. She's She's introduced at the end of season. Oh no! It's either the end of season six or beginning of season seven, along with little Ned Umber. The two of them are introduced at the same time. Okay. So basically, her and little. Umber were are just the remains of the northern houses who allied with the Boltons. Cool. In season six. So yeah. Okay. She's the only like kind of character that we don't know. Yeah. Who's there? <laughs> and then everyone else as well, everyone like Jorah's else. in there, and like I'm not, I'm just not sure why half of these people would would be in there. Um. <laughs> Although weirdly, I can't see Melisandre and um, no, Melisandre's sorry, Missande, sorry, and yeah. um, uh, Grey Worm. Grey Worm's there Is beside he? Varys. You can, I can just barely see his head. Okay. On the shot, on the shot I'm looking at here. Okay. So yeah, it's just completely Avengers <coughs> Assemble there. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, yeah. I mean, this is what I mean. What I meant earlier on when I said this this episode felt a little bit like fan fiction that was a fan fiction moment yeah um, it was again it was like they had a little drawing at some point in season four of all these people stood around near the end of the season like discussing the final battle plans kind of thing mm-hmm. and like it is a great image but it still but it has to has to feel real yeah to me that doesn't feel real it doesn't it just no. feels fake enforced um but yeah i mean it's it's become a different show to be honest and we and i'm i'm accepting that a bit more yeah as much as we don't like it you kind of have to go with it to yeah. some extent oh right after that Tyrion stays and talks with bran i like that that was more of old Tyrion as well mm. him showing an interest in just talking to people and learning things yeah great point actually yeah Oh, what? We got to see Ghost. Oh my God! In like one shot. Yeah, <laughs> and the, sort of S- half of his body o- poking into awkwardly shot. Awkwardly at the back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost as if. Do you know what's so weird about that? It's almost as if like he was quickly added over the week between like the first <laughs> episode and this one because they heard people complaining about no ghosts and they're like oh shit we had to put ghosts in so they quickly like digitally pop them in there oh man yeah but there was something else like that I can't remember what it was now there was something else that there was a few criticisms criticisms about last week that seemed rectified this week but I can't remember what it was um, but yeah uh, that was definitely one thing it was good to see ghosts though but it was good to see ghosts but Okay, <laughs> he's just standing there. He needs some point to him, doesn't he? Um, yeah, no one, no one acknowledges him. Like no. he's just there. It's weird. He is a bit weird. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and I, I, don't, I just can't see Ghost having any significance anymore, which is a shame because the whole thing about why would they have them finding the direwolves in season one, episode one? Like, yeah, I don't. You know that 
that moment, that scene, you don't need that scene. No, with the way, yeah, with the way things have gone now. It, yeah, it, you don't need that scene. Yeah, which is, with how kind of portentous it is, it it didn't actually amount to anything. No, it's a real shame. And yeah. maybe they just realised as it went on that it was going to be too difficult to do the whole warging thing, but... I love the three of them standing on the wall. Yeah. John, Ed and, and Sam. Was Ed in the first season? He was in season two. That's what I thought. And they yeah. said, here we all are again. Uh, and I thought, oh, yeah. you weren't in the first season, were you? But Well, he was with them in season two. I don't mind that. Okay. I'll accept that, like, yeah, he was he's supposed to have been around during season one, but he just... He wasn't cast yet. Okay. But it's like, they, they do interact a lot in season two. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then there was this scene. So. What well, scene? What are you talking about? What do you mean? You're like, and then there was this scene. I can't, what are you, <laughs> what are you on about? I don't know what scene you're talking about. <laughs> well, I was about to say, but you, right, you just okay. went, what scene? What are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah, what? but it's like you said, and then there was this scene as if you had a slideshow, like a PowerPoint presentation. You were pointing at something. It's like I'm not in the room with you, but I can't see where well, you're no, pointing. No, I hadn't at. finished the sentence. <laughs> All right, finish then. <laughs> Jesus. Um, yeah, the scene where they're all sat around talking in next to the fire, and um, yep. and uh, Tormund keeps on flirting <laughs> with Brienne. Yeah. Um, so did you like that? Did you? I actually did. Yeah, I can't believe I'm saying this because for, this seems like a scene that would really have annoyed me in like season seven or mm-hmm. season five or season six. But I, I think what it is is I've accepted that the scope and like ironically, as the budget has increased massively, the the scale of the show has decreased. And what I mean by that is it's literally now just the characters we know. Um are the only people that matter there are no wider consequences for anything anymore mm. but I've, I've accepted that they're the only people who matter now to some extent in the back of my brain and I've accepted that they're the ones that are going to have scenes with one another and I th- think due to the fact that I've accepted that I like this scene because if they're the only characters we have they're going to interact and they all are convinced they're going to die so let's just sit around and have a chat and a drink I mm. I, I don't know I bought it no I, I I did for the most part actually yeah I bought the whole scene for the most part yeah definitely I didn't dislike mm. it um, again it's got some of my favourite characters in there so you know I like Tormund his, his story crapped me up about the yeah. um, <laughs> climbing into bed with the giant yeah uh. Ah, oh, that was brilliant. I I laughed. Um uh. and uh <laughs> you can't the what's great is it's a bit like the story a few seasons ago where it was about the bear. Yeah. Such bullshit. Yeah, yeah but, but the thing but, is he says it in such a way that I don't think any character knows whether he's serious or not. Yeah. And it's just like <laughs> Like and, who is this freak? Yeah, and the, the audience don't know either. Yeah. But it's like yeah, it's brilliant. And he says it with such certainty. Yeah. It's just brilliant. He's just he's a great actor, so He is, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. And I, I enjoyed the the scene as a whole as well. I mean, w- with the slight interlude of uh Arya and the Hound and Beric Dondarrion having oh, a I chat. I forgot about that. Yeah. Um which is quite fleeting and not really much to say on. Um and no. The dialogue I thought in that scene was a bit rubbish, to be honest with you. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm not sure. It just felt pointless. It felt really inane and as if they were just bringing a few characters together in a different way that that yeah. probably wouldn't have been in the room by the fire. So they just had... They ha- they have to force them together somewhere yeah, else. exactly. Yeah. Um, d- they've missed a trick not having Sansa and the Hound uh, interact, though. I don't know why they haven't done that. Because he he was he yeah. stood up for her multiple times in King's Landing. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and he did. They just haven't addressed the two of them knowing each other, which is weird considering they're obsessed with pairing everyone up again. Yeah, it's weird and it's not weird because it's weird for the reason that you just stated, but then it's not weird because 
they are doing a lot of that anyway so <laughs> if you had more characters meeting and talking about things in the past it would be potentially overkill and they're probably just prioritizing again yeah. it, it it wouldn't have been this way had they not tried to squeeze it all into two episodes which is literally what they're doing because you do realize there will be no more reminiscing after this because there are only yeah. four episodes left so what they've done is they've squeezed in all yeah, of those front, things into front two episodes. the season yeah so the gendry and Arya scene it was just <sighs> for me just pure pure fan fiction yeah i didn't i didn't get it well i got it but i didn't enjoy it and it it just didn't feel earned or right yeah I don't know it didn't feel right I, I actually cringed a bit because I just thought <laughs> oh, I did. I didn't like it it felt wrong partly yeah. felt wrong because I uh, had been cast as a child so it didn't it didn't it felt weird like because yeah it's like this is Game of Thrones and she was cast when she was like 12 <laughs> or something younger and, I think pardon she was younger than that I'm pretty sure I mean it is medieval esque society anyway um, yeah so they're going to be younger but <laughs> so there's there's um, elements of that to take into consideration but it's still the whole thing still feels weird to me for a number of reasons and one of them was that I had this weird confidence that considering she was saying that she'd never done that yeah it felt uh, uh, just felt off to me and it felt a little bit i was a bit creeped out by it i'll be honest that someone could be as confident about something like that i don't know i, I don't know i don't even know what i'm trying to say to be honest so yeah i i, I kind of get what you mean it's just aria doesn't seem to make much sense her character yeah exactly i don't know what I, her I character is now i don't get it, her it's it's like she's an assassin and that's how it's characterized on with, with like big writing um an assassin, yeah exactly and it's like <coughs> with elements of Arya stark still remaining kind of thing like that's kind of the subtext of her um yeah whereas bran is a three-eyed raven with no elements of <laughs> bran still remaining <laughs> And Gendry's just been relegated to, for some reason, this this uh, gibbering, kind of awestruck little boy, essentially in Aya's presence. Um, <laughs> I don't get. I don't get that. I don't know why, where they've introduced that dynamic from. Why they expect the audience to buy that? No. In fact, one of the problems I had with that that sex scene felt like a modern sex scene. Yeah, it did. It felt like it was a teen drama. Mm. at that point like the way that they're undressing each other and stuff like that that's a teen drama type of sex scene that's not a medieval one of the things that I wish the show did more of was I wish it was more focused on the roots of this medieval type of society and which is what it felt like near the beginning of the show and in medieval type society sex especially out of wedlock mm would have been completely different to how we perceive sex today. Yeah. Now, how we perceive sex today comes with connotations and it comes with how we've perceived it on television. It it comes with the sort of uh, the eroticism that you've learned from novels and all sorts of literature and things like that. F- medieval-esque society sex between two people that one of which isn't very experienced and one isn't experienced at all wouldn't have played out in a way like that it would have played mm. out much more they wouldn't have had a clue well are you wouldn't have had a clue no think think about it rationally how would that character have had any idea whatsoever to do anything she would have had no idea there wasn't any sex education <laughs> in with the faceless man <laughs> yeah yeah, she wouldn't have had a clue. No. So you can say, well, animal instinct takes over. But yeah, but the animal instinct is is much more specific and and <laughs> wild and yeah. uh, less passionate. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, this you know, and this sort of level <laughs> of realism that that has been foregone is just more and more evident now, and. One of the things I wanted to say was I really want the North now to be looking like 
everyone's freezing and i want to know how much food they've got how what the stores are like like these are the what, what are the stakes what are the stakes exactly and I want to know what the stakes are beyond there being uh, these these sort of undead encroaching upon Winterfell yeah, and, and which of our characters will die it's it's bigger than that like weirdly it doesn't feel that big no it doesn't feel that important does it it's like the story lives or dies at Winterfell it do, like the, the wider realm doesn't seem to feature no in this in this like threat no because they just put all the characters in one place bar yeah. Cersei and that lot um, and and as I say they've, they've limited the perils to the fantastical elements whereas yep. before it was about the realistic elements too and that's what people, some people find interesting you know how would they have dealt with this how would they have dealt with a battle during winter that you know could potentially last for a while. How would they have dealt with that from a from a um, a rational sort of perspective? What would they do? How how much food have they gathered? Like how did they how do they farm in the build up to it? Like this is stuff that George will definitely go into, and stuff yeah. they've completely negate uh, failed to even mention, other than one passing line about uh, how am I meant to feed all these men yeah. by Sansa in episode one which was never answered by the way so no. we had a question raised an important question a valid question that was never answered and yet has been solved <laughs> seemingly yeah yeah. So, the, the, throughout the whole like it's redundant me even bringing this up as a point because everyone knows it like winter is coming yeah. has been there since the very start as a threat yeah it, it just looks quite pleasant up there and nice Exactly. You go for a nice little ski around Winterfell or something. Yeah, it like, does look nice. Yeah, yeah. It's really strange. It was more snowy when Sansa and Theon escaped Winterfell in season at the end of season five. Or yeah, five. There, there was there was way more snow there, and the conditions were yeah. way more harsh. And that's when Stannis died as well. Yeah, because you remember he was snowed in. Yeah, and that's why he burned Shireen. The, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the snow. The snow. The snow should... Everything should just be, like, ice cold. Like, people should be... You should be seeing them shivering. Yeah. Like, you should... You, we should be hearing about the deaths of people dying from cold as well, by the yeah. way. And starvation, maybe. Yeah. Well... These these are real... These, these, this creates drama and conflict and yeah. a, a, a sense of realism <laughs> in this world that is just... They've just completely, like, not bothered with. Mm-hmm. And I, it's just disappointing. We're at the uh, the nighting scene then. So I, I I said to Kian earlier that Brienne being knighted felt a little bit like fan fiction to me. And I disagreed. Yeah. I'm now. Do you want to explain why you thought that? Do you know what? What? I think I'm going to backtrack on that. Really? Mm. Well, you see, while you're thinking about that, I'll just give my perspective on it then, maybe. Because mm. I thought, like, I'm going to be honest, I thought it was a beautiful scene. I mm. I genuinely think it's one of my favourite scenes of all time in the show. Wow. And I say that that's... All hyperbole aside, I absolutely adore that scene. And I think it's totally earned. Everything the show has done, like you can have your misgivings about Jamie and Brienne individually maybe, but yeah. everything they've done together on the show, I think has been amazing. Mm. It's been brilliant. And they have such a complicated relationship and that they both do love each other. Yeah. But their personal it. situations are so complicated that they can't... They can't express that romantically. Yeah. Um, Jamie with Cersei and Brienne because of her upbringing and her identity, and she is she grapples with who she is and how she fits into the world mm. and the her identity as a woman. But how does that correlate with her abilities as a fighter and all this sort of stuff? But I I can see this as a scene in the books 
mm. later on. I'm convinced that George gave him this scene and that this com- this completes Brienne's narrative arc now because all she's ever wanted was to be respected for who she is not yeah. because of how society perceives her but because of who she is as an individual mm-hmm. and this is Jamie publicly acknowledging her proudly yeah uh, in front of others in front of other respected and strong people he's acknowledging her as an equal and giving her the merit that she has wanted her whole life and it's the first time we see her smile on the show as well and I I yeah, you know, I I actually I almost started crying watching this scene. I I loved it. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, the pro- the thing is, is when I was saying earlier about my examples of fan fiction, I'll be honest, that scene slipped out when I said that because okay. because uh, so I sort of didn't really mean it up to, in relation to that scene because I actually really enjoyed that scene too, and I did I enjoyed the way it played out and it did feel real and earned to me as well and it felt like th- the way it happened was really cool because it was the night before the battle type of thing and yeah. Jamie was like fuck it kind of thing yeah let's just do this <laughs> it was just because of an, an offhand comment by yeah Thorman exactly well. yeah so that felt really cool to me yeah. I, I guess the only element of, of it to me that made me think fan fiction-y was again the whole Avengers style of it like everyone yeah, okay. sat around um just a little bit convenient that these characters happened to be there at the time and things like that but okay yeah. but on hindsight i actually i actually um i don't think that anymore so i've changed really? my mind yeah i think i've changed my mind there yeah okay i mean i think it came off it was it was directly after a scene which i felt was really fan fictiony which was the Arya and gendry scene yeah okay and I had that in my mind so <laughs> so looking back at how I was emotionally perceiving it I think I was um, influenced by my uh, the hangover of the previous scene um, so looking back on hindsight I agree with everything you said <laughs> oh yeah that's good no, I'm glad you enjoyed it then because I, I I love that scene again Jamie is so so good like he is, the way he? I, um, Nikolai so he just elevated it again yeah it was good speaking of good I liked the way we were like immediately after that we're dropped into the middle of a conversation between Liana Mormont and Jorah mm-hmm. th- that actually felt natural to me yeah. it's because we've never seen these two characters together before and it hasn't actually been bashed over our heads that they're related mm. but we're dropped into the middle of a conversation via Sam mm-hmm. uh, between them and like other viewers are probably like oh wow okay they're related mm. that's cool and it's a cool way to find out mm. definitely and it, it goes back to what we were saying last week about how um, uh, they seem to miss some opportunities in the writing of coming in as late as possible I don't think we said this last I, don't, I can't remember when we you, said you this you know we didn't say, I know what you're going to say but you, you didn't actually say this last week yeah no it was it was in the preview wasn't it yeah um, was it arrive late leave early yeah right. exactly it that's seems. how you do it in screenwriting you arrive to a scene late and you you leave early and that's what they did here they yeah. they arrived halfway through the conversation and they left before it got boring and yep. that's exactly right <laughs> mm. next is when Pippin sings to Denethor as Faramir <laughs> <laughs> rides out towards us <laughs> I thought exactly the same thing <laughs> Wait, now, now who, it was Podrick, wasn't it? He was like, it was Pod, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was like the equivalent of Pippin. And <laughs> and it even did the same thing where, because I remember at the time when that happened in Return of the King, I liked it, but then as he as it cut away, it sounded like studio singing in Return of the King. Yeah, like, yeah. And exactly the same thing happened here where, yeah it sounds like he's in the room singing and then it cuts away and it gradually sounds more and more like he's in a studio and it's like oh <laughs> cringe <laughs> yeah ah oh, no I, I really like that as well though I, I love that little montage yeah I liked it too yeah it's a nice montage and it's and yeah. okay here's <laughs> I'm going to talk about the thing that I was going to talk about earlier now which yep. is uh, something that works in terms of narrative conflict and creating drama and uh, creating stakes but it's cheap as far as I'm concerned which Mm. is that what they've done 
over the course of these over the course of this episode and the last episode really is they've forced characters together and we've seen the culmination of this during this montage uh, one of the ways of creating stakes is by having characters fall in love and by then the fear or the threat of those characters being ripped apart so we've had that happen organically in some cases like Sam and Gilly over the course of a period of time we've had them over a period of time as is such with Masande and Grey Worm but to me that never felt particularly organic that always felt pretty tacked on mm -hmm. uh, and then really contrived so it's gone from one extreme to the other which is uh, Ari and Gendry uh, and then obviously John and Daenerys which they've created this added layer as well which but it but it was in the first place too contrived as far as I'm concerned and mm -hmm. the fact that we're supposed to believe that the I still don't buy that whole thing it's just all happened way too quickly for me but but it's it's moving like a movie now in terms of narrative uh, at yeah. least not in terms of because it's still quite slow in places but it's but in terms of narrative and what we're expected to believe has happened off screen mm -hmm. it's moving like a movie um so you know i can accept that too but 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 these sequences and these montage sequences are it was cool and it was nice but it's 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 cheap as far as i'm concerned at creating okay. dynamics where you're forced to feel stuff and you're you're forced to feel stuff on the basis of things they've only just told us furthermore such as Arya and Gendry um and yeah so that's how they're creating the drama now that's how they're creating the stakes by having these by having the threat of these characters being taken away from their loved ones and mm. i would have rather i would i i would have rather that they'd done that over a period of time um and not relied so heavily on love in a non-platonic sense and because there, there was already there were already relationships there to build that on anyway such as platonic ones and they didn't have to show people in bed together constantly to yeah um to do that and that to me just feels cheap it feels like a cheap trick there's yeah, a no I, I agree with that on a surface level I, I enjoyed the scene though away from all the emotional manipulation sort of stuff I thought it was really nice mm. the song the montage and for a brief moment for a brief moment I felt I felt that's the end of my sentence <laughs> I, fe I felt for these characters I was even right, felt Brian. for Missandei and Grey Worm <laughs> <laughs> felt for Missandei and Grey Worm did you? Jesus they've got me yeah why, why did you why did you call him Grey Worm as if like as if the emphasis was on worm as if there were loads of worms and he was the grey one he, he's the <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what about what about white worm and green worm no they didn't they they, they cut that out of the story <laughs> but do not remember they cut it off at the same time as they just lopped Dorn off <laughs> um yeah I, I I sort of don't, unfortunately. I find that a bit cringy. Those that oh, no, relationship. I, I don't. I don't now. But for a brief oh, moment okay. during that, they got me. They got That's me. What I mean? Yeah. yeah, they got me. My guard was down. Do you remember when um, Dave, the third casual corner? I, I know what you're gonna say. Yeah, go on. <laughs> said, "Why didn't they have Grey Worm just do a few press ups before?" <laughs> Is this what you were thinking? Yeah. Yeah. Just before uh, casting him or shooting any scenes with him because there's still and I still agree with that it's like why why is this amazing warrior it's not even that he's like an unsullied so they you know they they don't feel pain as much and they've you know it's all mental and things like that because you still would have physically have been through the things that they their training sequences demand thus your body has no choice but yeah, to put it, on muscle. It would, it would develop, yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah. And the the brain and the psychology may help push you through those boundaries, but your body would then respond to that. But instead, it looks like he's a guy that's literally 
just like I don't know, been playing Fortnite for the past six months. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's. I mean, we we could be it could be better to have a more warrior like Grey Worm leading the Unsullied into battle, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, again, probably a bit of pedantry there, but um, yeah. And then we've got John and Danny in the crypts. I liked it. So did I. Yeah, I liked yeah. it. I liked it. Um, yeah, I like honestly. I don't. I don't really have much to say about this because I liked it. I thought it worked. And as I said earlier, uh, Daenerys, her first reaction to finding out who John is was not to think about what that meant for him, but to think about what it did to her claim on the Iron Throne. Yeah. Her immediate reaction is me and what that means for her. Oh, shit. Yeah, good point. I hope you're right about this Yeah, so do I. Because, yeah, because maybe I've, maybe I lost, I've become too cynical because that's, that's a good point. Yeah, because Mm. she did say that and I hope it's for the reasons that you, that you're getting at rather than just, it just being coincidence, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah you know it doesn't mean that it, she necessarily I'm not hoping or expecting her to develop into this you know Walter White yeah yeah exactly and she doesn't necessarily have to develop that way but it, it it's nice if those subtle things are due to something and because of something so and then yes once that something possibly happens you can go back and track them and watch how it happened subtly yeah, exactly. It didn't just happen over the course of two episodes. Yeah, massively. Mm. So then, then, obviously, we end with the precursor to episode three. And yeah, it certainly looks like it's going to be a big battle, doesn't it? You could say that, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. exciting times. Yeah, I wonder... What will happen? <laughs> what to say? Like, cause, yeah, they've been hyping up this battle for like, like all the promotion has basically been around this, and all of John's dialogue for the last two seasons has been about this as well. Mm. I was saying John doesn't really have much to say anymore, does he? Apart from <laughs> talking about the Night King mm. and the Army of the Dead, but um, but, yeah, no, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, for all the flaws of of Jon Snow, uh, his writing, perhaps he always comes across like Jon Snow yeah does, does, does that make sense yeah it, it feels like he's a he's a a, a real person uh, yeah and I believe that character of Jon Snow that exists and, and I, I like Jon Snow the character yeah um, and I like Kit as well I think Kit does a great job yeah I think so too because even though he always speaks like this some yeah which like, he doesn't in real life which is weird <laughs> I know, but like Kit, Kit has caught a lot of flack over the years for his acting because people say he's boring or whatever. But he has a hard role to play because he's playing a, qu- a quiet introvert. Yeah, in in a position of power. Yeah, and that's that's not an easy job. Not not at all. I think Kit does a great job. Uh, yeah, like, as as someone who is kind of similar to John in ways, in that like I'm quiet and you know a, a lot a lot of my feelings and what I think about things is internalized. Yeah. Like I, I see that in the way Kit plays John. Exactly. I, I can I yeah, can same. see those elements of myself and like that's like credit to Kit. Exactly. Because it, yeah, exactly. And it is a hard role to play and that's one yeah. of the great things about Game of Thrones. Well, first of all it's one of the great things about George R. R. Martin's writing that he made characters like that in the first place because that that's such an unusual type of character. Yeah. Which sounds simplistic, but usually the main characters are very, very confident. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I thought that same thing about Theon. Theon's character is really unusual in the sense that he's, like, always insecure yeah. in in the beginning. And then even when he's been broken, he's a different type of insecure. Mm. Um, in the beginning, he's, like, trying to prove something constantly type of insecure. Yeah, and it's such an unusual character again. But um, but with with Kit and with Jon Snow, that 
and and with credit to the writing writers of the show they haven't changed that characteristic about John Stowe no they haven't made him into this shouty type of confident guy mm. but by the same token it hasn't lessened because some people might look at John Stowe and think oh he's a bit weak he's a bit wet because he doesn't really lead but yeah. I don't look at him like that I look at him as being strong because he's strong in a way that isn't often represented in media which is that he's honest and he's good and he cares about people and yeah. and that's strong like I don't I don't care what people say about you know what people's th- thoughts are on strength and weakness in in terms of because they usually relate to sort of levels of confidence and leadership capabilities and that's yeah. one type of strength sure but it's not all, that's not all there is to it no yeah that's a great that's a great little summary of John I think these so yeah I'm certainly looking forward to the next episode so so am I yeah overall I was yeah I still I still thought this thought there were too many I I, I felt like there were a lot of fan fiction-y parts to the episode um, but I'm excited about how it's all set up now yeah, so am I. And I'm very curious as to what happens for the three episodes after this next one. <laughs> like, if, if this yeah. whole threat that's been built up for seven seasons ends in the next episode. It's that's, kind of like, that can't oh, wait, happen. Oh, wait, what? What yeah. now? <laughs> oh, like, it's Cersei. Forgot about her. That can't happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's it. Once again, we find ourselves at an impasse as to how <laughs> to end these bloody things so we just fade out no what I would like to end it actually by saying if anybody does watch these videos or listen to them um, we really appreciate it we're just starting off with just a couple of casual corns and um, yeah please do leave a couple of comments um, about anything you'd like to hear from us if in the future and yeah what your thoughts are on whether or not this particular episode was fan fiction or not because Kian and I were in slight disagreement about that so it would be interesting to hear other people's views mm. and thanks for listening yeah. thanks guys bye <laughs>